What about unexpected processes in, in the in the environment? So I remember I was working. It's a group again. See, they all come from groups. <laughs> and suddenly, I'm in I'm in the institute, and the fire alarm goes off, and, and it turned out that we were locked in. Wow! I'd for, forgot to put my card out. So <laughs> then, no. So the therapist upstairs thought no one was in. So they went out, locked the door, put the fire alarm off. I was still in the building, and off goes the alarm. What do you do about that then? That's an unexpected process when there's an actual threat to the environment. Um, so as I say, it's all grist to the mill. There was another door we could get out of. But we dealt off the back of that with things that do happen unexpectedly to security and safety. And we yeah. were dealing with safety and security. And it took many, you know, I think of a couple of clients in that. We could use that. Um, that's another one. I've had been again a group where I've been doing some work and two people rushed in the room because they thought that they, that, 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 that uh, what was it about? I can't remember what it was about, but they didn't know there was a group. So there's a threat to the environment and the boundaries and what happens there. Yeah. Dealing with somebody who's been sexually abused, for example, and then suddenly. Somebody's bursting in. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can use it. The, the, the trick to this is you can use that. Once you've sorted it out, out and everything else, everybody's all right, you can go back and say, well, what happened there? Yeah. You know, is there any link to your childhood when there was such a, an invasion of your psychological spirit or whatever you like? Yeah, yeah. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Um, so welcome to the next podcast episode. We're on episode 57, and this one is the unexpected processes that can come up in therapy with me, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. You know, I was just thinking as you roll down the numbers, 57 has a good, you said 57, didn't you? I did say 57. Yeah, it has a good ring to it, 57. I like 57. I mean, seven is my lucky number. 57, five times my lucky number. So uh, that's great. I like the title of this uh, podcast as well. Unexpected processes in psychotherapy. Yes. You must have had lots. I've certainly had lots over 38 years of doing clinical work. Um, and I wouldn't say it's a regular occurrence, but I think if, I think the biggest thing to say about unexpected processes in psychotherapy is it's all grist to the mill. Love that phrase. <laughs> yes. I expect the unexpected. That's one of the things that I say a lot of the time. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the early days, and I know I've spoke about it before, I used to try and plan the session. And I suppose, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't own up to this. But I might have even steered them towards what I had planned for the session in the early yeah, days. Yeah. Whereas now, I think I'm a bit more confident that whatever comes up, I just trust the process. Well, that's marvellous. I was very similar to you. I think I think a lot of people in the early days, when I started seeing clients in 1985, I was the first client, certainly for a long time. And, uh, you know, I could sort of, I would say plan it, but I, I could see myself sort of moving therapy a certain direction. And when I took my exam, my CTA exam, my, I was in the TA world a lot then, and I became a clinical transaction analyst, I think about 1989. But I remember doing, uh, put another way, planning, because in the TA world, you have to get tapes and you take these tapes to normal board, they're there and they, listen to your three minutes or whatever it is, ask you loads of questions and hopefully you are okay with them and then you pass and become a clinical transaction analyst way back in the day. I yeah. think it was 88 or 89. But I, I do remember getting those tapes and because I wanted things to happen <laughs> in the tape so that I could say what I was doing in the most wonderful way, I, 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 did, sort of, I, I did sort of plan them in my head, if not reality. So I do know what you mean. I, I think as time went on, I sort of, yeah, just really went, to, saw everything as grist to the mill. Yeah. But that comes with experience. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I uh, a supervisor to people who've just started off their career in placements and they know long, they, they're nowhere, I mean, they just nowhere near that idea. It's a bit more like what you're saying, really. It's a bit like we've got a plan, which is working relationship, building up a therapeutic rapport, doing a bit of, um, you know, script analysis if we're lucky, maybe looking at how the past affects the present and integrating new decisions. And that's the sort of plan they have in their heads. Yeah, yeah. So it's not until quite a lot of clinical hours experience, I think we change that. Yeah, and quite a lot, it, it is quite a lot of yeah. clinical hours that you need before you can kind of take your foot off the gas and oh. just trust that, yeah, every session, there's, there's little nuggets, there's little gems in there. Yeah, and you know, one of the biggest I started, I mean, again, this one comes with experience, but one of the biggest, well, biggest, wrong word, but, but occurrences I'd like to talk about is what often is called in transaction analysis, and I don't know about other disciplines, but the doorknob transaction. Oh, we love a doorknob transaction. <laughs> <laughs> it means, you get, you know, most people have 55 minutes or 50 minute hours. So let's say it's 50 minutes. And on the 48th minute or the 49th minute, let's put it in dramatic terms, um, the, or even the last transaction before the 50 minute comes up, uh, they something, they, the, the client says something really dramatic. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I feel like killing myself and I think maybe today is the day or something, something really dramatic. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's called the doorknob transaction. They say right at the last minute to, to actually, uh, I think, not only get, you know, be dramatic, but also to, I think it's to warn the therapist um, of some unconscious processes that might be happening. And of course, the beginning naive therapist, I'd say naive in a very gentle way, um, they they can go into quick turmoil about that. Yeah. Or, or at the last minute they say, Oh, uh, actually, I forgot to say, actually, I've been having an affair for the last 15 years. But we'll come back to that next session. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah. Uh, you know, those sorts of things. That doorknob transaction, which is really so, so not in the script, it, it, it can throw a therapist very easily. Yeah. And I, I can remember thinking, you know, and taking that to supervision. Well, what, what do you do? Yeah. If somebody comes out with something dramatic like that and you've literally got another client that's waiting outside, what do you do in that situation? And what did the supervisor say back to you, Jackie? Well, they said that the session needs to end. You know, yeah. there's boundaries that need to be put in place. And obviously, it's a difficult situation. But the, you know, permission, protection and potency and all that sort of stuff, they knew when the session was going to end. Mm. Mm, that's Pretty right it, it, well certainly it is if you if you haven't got that much experience because like like you most therapists might go into turmoil and they will take it to supervision yeah but but your response in supervised gap gave back is the correct one uh, so you say something like wow that's something really interesting please uh hold that put it into the back burner or your pressure cooker and we'll start with that next week yeah that's the thing when you say that to them do you bring it up at the beginning of the next session yes right good because that's what i tend to do <laughs> it's Absolutely. like you're not doing that to me again at 49 minutes <laughs> <laughs> several reasons several reasons i think it's really important because the client might be saying it to hundreds of reasons to test you to be dramatic but also of course in the desire that the next session uh we won't be thrown off track again we'll go back to that yeah in the terms of continuity predictability holding the space i could give a few more reasons the therapist is really has to remember to go back to that movement away from script to go back to that last transaction and say I know a lot of things might have happened, but we must start where we left off. Yeah. I, I know you said that as the last transaction, so it must be really important that you've got something you want me to hear. 
yeah, totally. And, you know, without making, I don't want to make light of it at all, but that example that you gave at the beginning, I would like to think that, you know, the, the, with the transactional analysis, the escape hatches have been looked at and that, you know, that there are sort of things put in place if a client does say that they don't want to be here anymore. Yeah, so if they said that last transaction, I would say something like, I hear this is a really important thing you said, can you put that in the back boiler burner till next week when we can explore this? And 10 to 1, they say yes. If they say no, then I might say, well, how about we have a, an emergency session in two days' time? Yeah. I, I think would... that's, that's what I would offer, is it? A, a session, yeah. you know, yeah. an immediate session yeah. rather than leaving yeah. it a week. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did definitely address the safeguarding issue. Don't get me wrong. But what I wouldn't do is go over five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen, 10, 15, because we get to the end of the 15th minute over time if we did. And uh, and maybe there'll be another door dog transaction. So we yeah. need to keep our boundary. And if we need an emergency session, OK, we'll book one in. Yeah. And I think boundaries within the therapy, I know we've touched on them before, but I do think they're really important. And sometimes in therapy we are dealing with the child and the child will always try to push boundaries <laughs> yeah i mean i mean 10 to 1 we're nearly always dealing with the younger self and the younger self according to the developmental level of the trauma will push boundaries yeah yeah so, so it is our job to to let them push against them but be kind of steadfast in what they are yeah absolutely and um I think what I'm talking about here in door knob transactions will happen to therapists. Yeah. There's not a, there is not a, a doubt about that. Yeah. Um, it's just the therapist needs to know how to handle it. And if they, you know, if it's the first time it's happened to them, take it to supervision. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Because mm. it, is, it is daunting when, when they do that. It can certainly be really demoting, uh, really sort of daunting. And of course, if it's very dramatic uh, or more dramatic, and especially if there's a safeguarding issue, um, I think it's really important that the therapist, if there's a doubt on the client not being able to do the back burner, is to offer them an emergency session if they can. Yeah. And I would suggest the therapist makes room for that. Yes. Yeah. 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 The other thing that happened to me in the early days as well, was a client disappearing, not showing up and, you know, not, I, I, not answering emails. So, and that was unexpected for you, you didn't expect it? Yeah, no. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of like when you look back at the previous sessions or looked at the work that this client has been done, nothing was sort of like in the radar for you to, to ex, you know, for some to expect somebody to not come back like that. Yeah, no, not at all. What did you do in that occurrence you're talking to me about? Well, again, I took it to supervision, um, and I think I texted them first just to check in and make sure that they were okay, and there was no response. And then I sent them two emails, like spaced a week apart, and I never got a response from them. So, what did you do? not a lot that I could do well I mean what you can do is close for yourself you yeah I think making a closure is important for the therapist as well as for the client once you've done all the safeguarding issues you can do all the the things you just started to tell me that you did then I always recommend to people in that situation clients and uh, therapists in that situation is 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 to take some control and make a closure for themselves and maybe send a further email or text or email, I'll probably say, um, and say, you know, I've been trying to get hold of you, not, you're not on XXX, um, and I'm sure you'll take your own path in life or whatever, whatever you wanted to say, and I wish you well. So, so it's almost like you're, take, you're taking the yeah. processes in terms of a closure and the termination. Yeah, I think I probably put something like that in the last one that I did send them saying, yeah, yeah. You know, the, if you need to get back in touch in the future, feel free. And, yeah, you know, it. I hope everything works out okay type of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and no, yeah, that, another, another, I've had that, by the way, just what you've just talked about quite a few times. Um, another unexpected process, if you like, in psychotherapy is when, and I don't know if you had this, the client runs out of the door and doesn't come back. Or the client runs out of the door and goes, in my case, uh, I'm just thinking of somebody who went into another room in the institute they were in. Or uh, they suddenly just disappear in the building or any of those situations where the script or whatever you're working on has had such a lot of discomfort for the person that they've had to get away, you know, moved into that flight process. Um, so that's when we buy unexpected. And um, I think that's happened a few times for me. And certainly when it first happened, I thought, oh, what should I do here? And uh, um, I was always, I did take the supervision in this case as this happened, but I was always trained that if somebody's sort of running out for you or trying to get away, and I've got a big therapy room, you, you say in a sort of controlling, transac controlling parent transaction, uh, would you please come back here? You know, you go to a sort of place where you're setting a, a boundary through the positive controlling parent. Um, and you, I wouldn't say it's a demand but or a command, but you say, come back here, we'll deal with it now. Yeah. Or, or something like that, where, you may, where you, you're stepping up. I mean, uh, I remember in my last three months of working that that happened with someone, and I said, Look, we can deal with this. Come back here. It's important you do not go outside in this particular scared place you're in or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. Come back in, we'll talk about this. So, but you need to do it from a directive, positive, controlling place. Yeah. Now, earlier in my clinical career, I've had when people gone out, they've gone into another room. Now, if it's group psychotherapy, I would send probably one of the group to look for them while I stay with the rest of the group. And then we get a contract about when they're going to come back. Yeah. Uh, if they disappeared altogether, I do all the safeguarding issues. Um, so um, sometimes when you are working with somebody and they, 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 there's a you know, fear flight response sort of triggered, um, that can happen. Yeah. I've had them go to the loo and be there for quite a long time, yeah. but they've never actually left the building, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, they've left the building. I've got you've got to do safeguarding. Yeah. Purposes. But uh, it's more often they've gone into another room. And yeah. Then, I say it's group psychotherapy because some of if it's just myself, I will go and find where they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And see that they're not harming themselves, or whatever. and then um, get you do know, some contracting about you know, we'll continue this session and then we deal with that. Um, that's uh, that's an unexpected, unexpected thing I was thinking about. Yeah. I've had many unexpected things in group psychotherapy, particularly um, a couple psychotherapy, particularly when you're working with a couple, then one person says, oh, I've got something to say. And then they come out with the fact they have been having an affair for 30 years or something. And I didn't expect that. And the other person didn't expect that. There's many, much, many things around clinical content which yeah. I've often been surprised about. Which, you know, to be fair, it doesn't surprise me that you can throw all these in there because you've been practicing for a very long time. So yeah. the, the more length of time you're practicing, the more likely you are to be opened up to these weird and wonderful happenings within the therapy room. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and it, it, the big thing I want to say here is mostly these types of occurrences happen when you're dealing with the younger parts of the person's self. In, yeah. other, in other words, when they're often regressed and are at a younger age. Yeah. And that's when they will move out of scrap script. That's when they may reenact the trauma. That's when they may go into a fear and flight response. And, and from that place, you need to, to, to really make sure uh, that they're okay yeah. and don't allow them i say don't allow them but try and assess where assess and make sure they're in their adults eager state in ta terms before they leave the building yeah because they might have to they might have a power, powerful car outside yeah 
uh, and I learned that many, 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 many years ago. I'm talking about 30 odd years ago when I was in training. I remember uh, one of the first group sessions, I started to work with groups. Um, and what I thought this group had gone well. Uh, I thought that though with the, the person was doing a piece of work of their inner self, I thought they were no adult. And that's a hard one to judge in a way. I mean, I say it very straightforwardly. And as a transactionalist, there are things that you can rely on observationally to give you some clues that are an adult. So I thought the person was 27 years of age. I didn't think they were, you know, stuck back in the age of, I think, 15 we were working with because of all the, uh, so I thought, adult observational skills. So we ended the session, they went off. Anyway, the next week when they all came back, uh, the woman said to me, you know, I was particularly annoyed with you because you know, uh, I needed to have stayed an extra five minutes at the center to ground myself because I was going to be driving. I was going to be driving a car, but I felt so young I couldn't drive enough to call my husband to come and fetch me. Wow! And I, I was very young as a therapist. I've been running groups, I think, at groups for about four or five months, and I thought they were an adult. I well, to be fair, she did act in an adult manner as she yeah. called her husband to come and pick her up. So, <laughs> to be fair, yes. Yeah. <laughs> she managed to get to adults. Yes. You know? Yeah. Uh, um, I think it was also a plea for being special and that I needed to take care more. And it's a very, re a, a very real example because as a transaction analyst, we were really trained as much as we can to go out of our way. To make sure that a person doesn't leave in a regressed state yeah and one of the things that i didn't do and i could have done was that to have asked the person yes yeah it sounds a simple thing yeah i, I remember i didn't do it so i i've learned a lot of things through my mistakes as i've gone along um but that's a really big one for the listeners i think to as much as we can make sure they're in their adults and they're in you know the age appropriate state that they are yeah. Or even ask them if you think they've stuck in a younger place. Yeah, I hundred percent agree with that. I have had to, you know, when when a client's I've had a few clients that have had a panic attack, and you know, we've kind of ended the session early, so to speak, and I've just spent the last 20 minutes grounding them. And when you said earlier on about being in your controlling parent type, I I was really firm with them. That's it. To Fair. get them back again. Yeah. That's a good. I mean, I always remember an Australian therapist who's a very dear friend of mine that I've lost contact with her now. Uh, she had this concept about the firm parent, which Byrne yeah. called controlling parent. But I like the word a firm parent because I think it's more somehow uh, it sums up a much more, I don't think, friendly uh, sentence than controlling parent because people can sometimes think that's quite negative but I like the idea of a positive firm parent yeah I think I surprised myself how firm I actually was in that moment when I needed to be because anybody that knows me knows I'm I'm not very firm I'm not I don't like confrontation and it felt like I was literally squaring up and saying you know enough now you need to stop you need to slow down you need to breathe and I was literally taking it step by step mm. Good for you. Just Good wouldn't you. let her go off again. Mm. You know, also things, I mean, I could trip all these, you can see the way I'm talking, there's so many examples. Often, if people, if clients are going to enact things out in the therapy session, it's usually over things like endings, money, power dynamics. Money is a favourite one. Yeah. And I've learned, I learned eventually, I don't know how long it took me to ask people to pay before the session yes. and I can remember when I hadn't got that um, that policy so people were allowed to pay after the session and I remember uh, someone who was working actually I can't remember what he was working on but we got to the end of the session we ended and everything and and he wrote the check out scrumpled it up and threw it, in, threw it at me I <laughs> really, really? Really surprised. You know, it's almost like he'd moved ego states from this sort of, um, I don't know what adult ego, I don't think he was an adult, but when he moved, he went to child, obviously, uh, and he threw this uh, this check and stormed out. Um, 
Uh, but the biggest thing to do is to start with that next week. Don't not let it go, that yeah. disrespectful action. Yeah. Because it's actually like an attack on yourself. Yes. Yeah. You know, which really is something to do with his history. And it turned out to be, of course, uh, money, men's other things for him that are associated with the father, you know. So it, there was a lot in it. But the golden rule with all these things is don't go on in the therapy. You need to always come back to the process. Yeah, I, I agree with that entirely. Because it for me, if I didn't, it would be a big fat elephant in the room. Absolutely. It would always be there unless we brought it back in and discussed it and put it to bed, so to speak. That's fine. Here's another one for you. And please stop me because I could go on and on with <laughs> forever. But here's another one because I spent 36 years as a group psychotherapist and quite a lot of the processes I'm talking about, I realised as I speak happening in groups. But one of my rules or frameworks in a group, uh, and this happened from this experience, was that because people are often in child eager state, that if they start a relationship up with each other, one person will need to leave that psychotherapy group and go into another psychotherapy group that I run. And I used to run two or three a week. But that rule only came out of, I was running, <laughs> this is an unexpected process. I was running <laughs> eight people in a group and just about to start it and the person put their hand up and said, I've got something to announce. And then they were there and they were having sex and with someone in the group. Now I hadn't got that in. So out of that unexpected process came a much more protective rule. Uh, and because when people are in therapy, they're often in their child ego state yeah. and they often then meet from the traumatic child ego state. And nine times out of 10, I want to say 10 times out of 10, because I do know people who have, you know, met from in groups and gone into relationships and things like that. But many of the times, it, it, it's a disaster for script enactment. In other words, yes. they are enacting out their script. Yeah. Um, well, if they're both in the group, they're both doing it. It's bad enough when one's doing it, but if they're both doing yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, so there's an unexpected thing. That wow, you've seen it all. See, I've I've never done groups. I've, I've done couples, but I stop at two. I've done families, like mum, dad and children, but I've never done group therapy. That is like putting out fires, I would imagine. I love, I love, someone said to me the other day, you know, did you enjoy your clinical career? I mean, I still do supervision and I still do the assessments, but I've stopped seeing people individually in groups. And I think of all the things I've done, I would probably say I loved my career um, as a group psychotherapist. And I think it's because, why would that be? I think because there's so much dy dynamics in the group. Yeah. I saw so much transformation in groups. I so, saw some vicarious healing. One of the saddest things for me, Jackie, is, you know, we're, we're, you know, 85, I started in the late 80s, beginning of the 90s. There were many, many TA therapists around groups. 2022, can you find a TA group therapist? Not very easily. I doubt it, yeah. I'm not sure is probably the only one that I know of. <laughs> I don't know. If, I'm not sure why the, the sort of interest in group psychotherapy has declined over the last 35 years but certainly that is the case but I love my time as a uh, and it wasn't until I was 64 65 that I went down from running two or three groups a week and then my last four or five years I went down to one group a week but at my height in the 50s I was running four or five a week flipping out yeah, take me hat off to you. Like I said, I stop at couples. Couples, yeah. I, well, I couples I must have had some unexpected processes in couples. Yes, yes, there have been some. It's yes, not well, all relationships end well when people come to couples. There no, you learn so much from it. I mean, I another one I learned when I started seeing couples, and uh, I learned it from a mistake. So. Uh, well, I call it a mistake, but actually, as I said at the beginning of this podcast, it's all grist to the mill. Yeah. But anyway, at the time, it seemed like a big mistake, and I got myself sort of caught caught up in catch twenty two. So I've seen this couple, and 
you know, this is the beginning of my couple's life, really. But I started seeing this couple, and we decided that I'd see four sessions with the uh, uh, wife, four sessions with the husband, and then they'd come back again. Yeah, okay. Fine, that sounds good, doesn't it? But what I didn't do was say, well, we'll make it an open contract. So that means that if things get shared, you know, with you, when we come back together, you know, we're not going to go through everything, but we, we, we can leave it open. Yeah, fine. I didn't do that. So what happens then, of course, uh, and I think it was the female said to me, well, actually, you know, I've been having an affair for 20 odd years, but I'm trapped. Well, I felt yeah. I was trapped at that time because I hadn't got an open contract. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, crafty. <laughs> well, I ended up saying, look, could, uh, uh, you know, because she's she said, well, it's very confidential. You can't tell Jim. It's not, it wasn't Jim. I made up a name. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think I said at the time, well, I feel quite trapped here. Can we change that? And I think we were. I was able to talk my way into a new contract. But these unexpected things can suddenly just occur, you know. Yeah. I think human beings are slippery creatures. <laughs> well, they're acting out their script off. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And of course they're playing it out. I mean, I'm not, I, I wonder if you've ever had this. So I was seeing a client, um, I don't know, four, five, six, seven, or eight, six, maybe four, five sessions. And then I got a phone call uh, from another person. This is years ago. And I started seeing her and um, uh, it just, I thought I've seen this person before. I felt I had anyway. Anyway, on the fifth session, she suddenly said she was, she was, a, 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 you know, a sister of the person I was seeing individually. So suddenly I had two sisters. Nightmare. Nightmare because the unethicality of that. Yeah. Is that you don't work with members of the same family. Yeah. But, but of course the tap then is, both of them or one of them will feel abandoned and rejected by me so what do I do I went in the end took it to supervision and his advice was to go with contractually you know the person that came latest if you'd like would have to be the one that left yeah but I've, I've not fun. actually been in that situation but I have had clients ask if I can see another family member and mm. get quite put out when I say no mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah well that's they do get put out, yeah, but yeah. It, it's a very strong ethical code, code in nearly all therapeutic disciplines that you don't work with members of the same family. Yeah, and even, let me run this one by you because I'd like your opinion on it, is if I've finished seeing with sisters and if I've finished seeing the one sister, as in, you know, they haven't been back for a while, and then the other sister comes... I couldn't go then back and see that original sister. No. So that, uh, do you know, the same time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If there's a big gap in time. That would be all right. Yeah. But those are the sort of things that I say that, you know, that's one of the reasons why I can't, because if you have a break, you wouldn't be able to come back and see me. And, you know, you're my priority. You are my client now. So therefore I wouldn't take on anybody else in your family or close circle. Yeah. That's right. What about unexpected processes in, in the in the environment? So I remember I was working. It's a group again. See, they all come from groups. <laughs> and suddenly, I'm in I'm in the institute, and the fire alarm goes off, and, and it turned out that we were locked in. Wow! I'd for, forgot to put my card out, <laughs> so then no. So the therapist upstairs thought no one was in, so they went out, locked the door put the fire alarm off i was still in the building and off goes the alarm what do you do about that then that's an unexpected process when there's an actual threat to the environment um so as i say it's all grist to the mill there was another door we could get out of but we dealt off the back of that with things that do happen unexpectedly to security and safety and we yeah. were dealing with safety and security and it took many yeah, i think of a couple of clients in that we could use that. Um, that's another one. I've had been again a group where I've been doing some work and two people rushed in the room because they thought that they, that, 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 that uh, what was it about? I can't remember what it was about, but they didn't know there was a group. 
So there's a threat to the environment and the boundaries and what happens there. Yeah. Dealing with somebody who's been sexually abused, for example, and then suddenly... Somebody's bursting in. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can use it. The, the, the trick to this is you can use that. Once you've sorted it out, out and everything else, everybody's all right, you can go back and say, well, what happened there? Yeah. You know, is there any link to your childhood when there was such a an invasion of your psychological spirit or whatever you like. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I agree with what you said right at the, the beginning of this, that, you know, we all, in the early days, we can't get everything right all of the time, but it's yeah. about putting things in place and learning from the experience that, you know, under we have, to, we have to learn by our experiences. Yeah. I mean, we can, we can actually learn from most of the mistakes we can recover most things with our clients in yeah. fact some of the most significant healing has come from ruptures in the mistakes if you want to use that word that i've made yeah and for me rather than the, the mistake or you know the unexpected thing that happens i think the therapeutic relationship is built on what comes next <laughs> and yeah. how you move on from that that builds trust again with the client yeah yeah, that's hundred percent, and it, 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 it it's these learnings that made me the uh, robust therapist I became. To the end, at the end, honestly, there was nothing really. Well, I I felt I could deal with most things because I saw it as all grist to the mill. Yeah, um, which is a really good phrase to use. Yeah, to get to that place, though, you are correct. You said it earlier. It takes quite a lot of experience. It does. And when, when, you know, when you first said to me in training that, you know, that you're new to this and it's going to take you a long time, I didn't realise how long the long time was, but it is. Experience mm. comes over time. It's not anything you can learn. It's, it's time. It is time. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, I think I probably thought the same as you, that it wouldn't take such, such a long time for me to feel that I could be that robust and seasoned psychotherapist that I came, but it was through experiences uh, in the therapeutic processes individually and in a group that made me the uh, therapist I was. And became. I'm still out, Bob. I know you're not practicing now. So until the next episode, Bob, where we're going to be looking at the search for meaning in therapy. Yeah, one thing that I want to say, thank you for allowing me to go on in this podcast. I feel I've but I feel I've just gone on. But I think, you know, I don't get much chances, perhaps. I don't do enough for myself to reflect on my all the wonderful clinical moments I've had. I don't think any of your wanderings don't have something in them that we can all draw from, Bob. Oh, thank you for those. Oh, I will let you wander as much as you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Meander. I was always known for meandering, by the way. You, you I was were, a yeah. clinician and, than a teacher and trainer. I wasn't a bad trainer, but I was known for meandering. You were known for meandering, hundred <laughs> percent. And I loved your meandering. No, but it's true. You know, you you've got so much to offer, and one of the ways that you can do that is by pulling on your experience and giving yeah. examples of each one of these things. Yes, I, I, I think that's true. I do too. So until the next time, Bob. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.